book of Ruth. What an incredible journey this is. And before we get going, any of our children who would want to be dismissed for our scripture adventure, please make your way on to the back door. Mr. Brian Holbrook is there with, I know, some exciting things for you guys. So uh, you can go out either way. But uh, others who may want to make their way out, Mr. Brian will lead you on downstairs. And we really are thankful for the continuation of that vital ministry. Well, as we begin to take off today, I was thinking so much during this series that each one of our proclamations is, is like a trip and we, we take off and we go a certain distance and then we'll land and then the next week we continue our journey uh, together. And so today as we take off, a word that, as I studied this passage, considered these verses, was the word assurance. I thought about how so many people, as I was reading that this morning, are afraid. It's kind of like the opposite, isn't it, of assurance. Instead of being afraid, but to really be assured and confident. Assurance, it can be defined this way. It is a positive declaration intended to give confidence. It also is linked strongly with a promise. I really believe assurance is vital for human health, for our soul, that which is inside of us that is unseen and invisible. The statistics I read really bear that out. Our mental capacity and our thinking are so affected when we're afraid, also emotional and, and how we're feeling, and also our choosing. If we're assured and we're confident, we really do make choices that sort of align with that, with faith and, and hope and love. And one of the things that assurance does, too, it helps with our physical well-being. The statistics have so proven that out, that how our soul is really, really will reflect uh, outwardly and, and how we physically feel. So assurance is so powerful, and it's so encouraging to us. And so it's with that introduction that I want to invite you to join me in going to the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures. As you know, we're in the book of Ruth, and we're going to continue our considerations of a proclamation that we're considering from chapter 3. We're calling it Ruth, Her Request. And as always, we just acknowledge, and I think it's so important, because in a day and an age of such independence that we would acknowledge our dependence upon the indwelling presence of Christ and the Holy Spirit to open our understanding, to strengthen us, encourage us, and that as we would interpret the Word of God, that we would apply it, that today as, as we go forward from this place, we're changed and transformed into manifesting ever increasingly the likeness of Christ. And without the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, we are unable to do that. So how we pray that he would bless us in that way. So that moves us to our exposition. And I, I wanted just to give us a few reminders just before we continue on today. We've seen an overview of the book of Ruth. The one thing I wanted to just highlight again, as I will each week so we don't lose this sight in our divine north, is the Almighty God, Jehovah or Yahweh, what is really revealed here is His uh, sovereignty and providence in history or His story, His purpose, His promise, His plan, and His perfection. He has the right people at the right place, at the right time, for the right reasons. I love the selections that the praise team led us in, that a lot of times we're unaware, aren't we, of those things? But yet, he isn't. I heard, and I, I don't know if I have the correct number on the dog, but I think in our nasal passages, 
I think I heard, and maybe a medical person could help me out here better, that we have like 20 million somethings that are, yeah, that help us to smell. But a dog has over 200 million. Am I right on that, Jackie? <laughs> you know? But anyway, the point is, is that's why the sense of smell in a dog is so heightened and so sensitized. And I think about that spiritually. Isn't that a great way to think that, oh, God, give us 200 million, you know, of those incredible sensitivities to notice, to recognize, to hear the things that he's saying and what he's doing. Isn't that incredible? We'd be like my little raven running all over the place in the backyard. And I just think that that's one of the powerful things about this book is we can see his story, God's story, being uh, lived out in front of us. We never want to lose that thought. So Ruth 1 and 2 is God's sovereign and providential preparation. We saw here the setting in chapter 1, and then we saw her story in chapter 2, which leads us to like an overview of Ruth 3 and 4. And this is God's sovereign providential plan or His will fulfilled uh, through people, ordinary people, Naomi, Ruth, and, and Boaz, ones who were going to be crucial in the line of the Messiah. And so vitally, vitally important. And so timely and timeless for us. He's doing the same thing. He's working his will, his plan, his purpose through ordinary people. Uh, just like us today. And chapter 3 is all about hope. And we're calling it her request. And it's in Verses 1 to 18, our interpretive insights here, really we're just making several pastors explanatory observations. The first one we've seen is Naomi's wisdom. That was in the first uh, four verses. Instruction, and I love this, a strategic plan, which is what we're doing in regards to the tent. We're holding it with an open hand that he's directing our steps. And then we saw last week our second pastor's observation was Ruth's appeal. I wanted to reread that before we move in. From the Amplified, it says, And Ruth said to her, All that you say to me, I will do. So she went down to the floor and did just as her mother-in-law had told her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then Ruth came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man, Boaz, was startled and turned over. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who are you? My dear Pam and working in the school system now, and she's working at a Hickory Elementary. As I have mentioned before, she, she gets to wear scrubs now. So she's bought all these scrubs. And the other day she came down and she had these scrubs on and one of them, it, it had owls all over it. So I looked at her and I said, who, who are you? <laughs> of Boaz. Pam said, it's too early in the morning and I'm about to show you who I am. And I think that incredible uh, circumstance that we really see with, with uh, Boaz. Who are you? He doesn't know if it's a thief, doesn't know who it is, it's dark. And she answered, I'm Ruth, your maidservant. Spread your wing of protection over your maidservant. For you are next of kin. Just before we, we move on into uh, the next section, just wanted to highlight a couple of things to me that were really, really important that really tie through. What we really see here is Ruth's moral integrity and purity. Don't mistake that. We talked about it last time. What she does is she approaches Boaz in accordance with tradition and custom. Ah like the thought that she, she draws near. 
And even as we think about us with the invitation of God to draw near, she draws near and then she appeals. She appeals to him for redemption in accordance with the Mosaic law. That leads us to this morning, which is a Boaz's assurance. This is going to cover 10 to 18, but we're going to make two textual thoughts here. And we'll just make one today. We're going to call it his integrity. What we're going to see here is his response. That was kind of where we left off with last, last week. How is he going to respond? But we're going to see here purity and honesty and all those things that align with integrity. Look at Ruth 3, and I'm going to read 10 through 13. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not, want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. The book of Ruth, Act 3, Scene 3, is absolutely incredible. Ruth has made her bold request. She has asked or appealed in humility and honesty, with total honor. And I just mentioned earlier, but I, I wanted just to, to re-mention it. Whenever we make an appeal or a, a request, there's always a risk of rejection. She was doing that. There was a risk of rejection. That causes so many people to not step in faith fearing failure. You can't fail if you don't try. That was one of the things for me when I uh, went to play football at Virginia Tech. I'll never remember, I'll never forget walking across and I had this little Rydell bag that was strapped across me when I went into the coach's office and said, I want to try out to play for the football team. And I know if I didn't do that, if I didn't take that step, if I didn't do that, so many great things God's done in my life would not have occurred. But there was a risk of rejection because actually Perry Willis looked at me when I asked him that question and he laughed because he was the one that was ahead of the... And I weighed 145 pounds, which probably the lightest Division I football player that year. And if there was anybody lighter than me, it would have been a kicker. And I think they weighed more than I weighed. And the whole thing is, is there was also a reward. What she has here, and it's so important, is the reward much greater than what I had, but it was a reward of redemption. I thought about it this way. Can you just imagine what is going on in her mind? I can think her heart must have just been beating out of her chest if you just would just kind of enter into this whole scene with me. There was probably some confidence in her, I'm sure, if she was perceiving all that was going on, but I'm sure there had to be concern. I coined this phrase, confident, expectant, anxiety. Kind of puts everything together. She was probably confident, expectant, but there had to be a level of anxiety. Have you ever been nervous about anything? Have you ever had what they call butterflies in your stomach? Can anybody relate to that? I'm the type of guy that's got airplanes in my stomach. Forget the butterflies. You know, it's helicopters and airplanes, and when you're, you know, all these kinds of things going on. I can only imagine that was probably going on um, with Ruth. 
in this moment. So how's Boaz going to respond? Well, what's so incredible is, is we don't have to wait. She didn't have to wait. He exclaims to this unexpected visitor who is not a thief, who he may have thought was there, but it's Ruth. And look what he says in verse 10. Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter. What an incredible thought. Boaz joyfully welcomes and accepts her and her presence with him on the threshing floor at that moment. And notice he first blesses her, affirming her. The Lord bless you. She probably had no idea how he was going to receive her. But the spotlight here that I wanted to make is I just love his God-centeredness. We saw it in chapter 2. He begins with the Lord, and he calls God's blessing upon her. And then secondly, he endearingly addresses her in relation to their age difference, but I also think he has such a compassionate heart for her, and he calls her my daughter. Just an incredible term of endearment and love and care. And then he commends her, as we continue in verse 10, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning. What Boaz is referring to here is in essence her faithful loyalty that was manifest not only and most importantly to the God of Israel, but to her family. In particular to Naomi, her mother-in-law. And all that faithfulness that we saw in chapter 1 and chapter 2, and now to Boaz. You see, her loyal love or her loving kindness is overflowing. It's exceeding abundant. It's amazing the songs you'll pick out a lot of times, Rachel, because that ties in with his love. It's immeasurable. And that's the love that he wants to flow through us because Jesus lives in us by the power of the Holy Spirit to others. That's what's pictured here. Is it's, it's amazing to Boaz. The loving kindness that is flowing through Ruth. We might say it in our vernacular, I've never seen anything like it. That's how amazed Boaz really is in seeing Ruth and her life. The Amplified Version says this, For you have made this last loving kindness greater than the former. What a humble response from him. And he not only commends her loyal loving kindness, but also her in not pursuing other younger men. As he finishes out in verse 10, she seemingly very easily could have pursued other, other men with her personality and probably her looks. And he says here, in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. I love some of the thoughts that Dr. John MacArthur put together here that Ruth really demonstrated moral excellence is what he says there and that number one she did not engage in sexual immorality which would have been a great temptation also she did not marry outside of the family She's just living in accord with the things that she's learning and hearing from Naomi. And then also she appeals to an older godly man for the fulfillment of this incredible thought of a kinsman redeemer. Just amazing to see these things. And when you think about it, it's just uh, as he's viewing it from his vantage point, her decision 
just demonstrates this great loyalty to not only Naomi, but also it's relating to him. Boaz continues, if you look at verse 11, and he says, and now my daughter. Whenever we see something like, and now, and I would hope for you as it did for me, as I was looking at it this week, I, I leaned forward thinking this is a transition. This is a hinge moment. This is really a gripping time that we've seen as we've made our way through this incredible story. And he calls her my daughter. That has to be so encouraging to her, the compassion, the care, the loving kindness, just the things that we say to people, the way that we say them, what we say to them. It's just so vital in their progression. And, you know, one of the things is, you know, we said it, you just can't get words back. And we need to be conscious and cognizant of what we say and, and how we say it, that they're really building up and they're encouraging. And I just see her just moving in this incredible direction of infusion, of, of confidence and courage. And then he assures her, and he says these three words as we have it in our text, do not fear. Fear not. Do not worry about a thing. Do not be afraid. When he said that, I think there must have just been like an emotional decompression. Have you ever been there where you just waited to hear those affirming, assuring words from somebody? Maybe you had the butterflies in the stomach and then all of a sudden... They said to you that which was loving and caring and affirming and accepting, and you just like, <sighs> like open a, a good Dr. Pepper, Larry, right before you're going to heat it up with, with lemon, and you open it up and just, <sighs> oh, I think that was what happened for her soul, is hearing that, just building up, just that decompression. You see, that's what is so important even when it's talking about people and hope, that we're infusing in their hope and decompressing their hopelessness and changing their perspective of where they're looking. My daughter-in-law, Kristen, we were talking about something and she was such a great encouragement to me. She said, Papa, Everything is going to work out just as it should. And it's almost like that's what I really see here is, Ruth, everything's going to work out just as it should. Do not fear. Warren Wearsby lists a number of things. Rob, you probably read these. I just wanted to give us a few things. He says, Fear not is the word of assurance that the Lord gave to many of his servants, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the nation of Israel, Joshua, King Jehoshaphat, the Jewish remnant, the prophet Ezekiel and Daniel, Joseph, Zacharias, Mary, the shepherds, Paul, the apostle John. And then for us in the church, he would close with this statement. You and I can say with these spiritual giants from Hebrews 13, 6, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is for us. The Lord Jesus Christ lives in us. The Lord Jesus Christ is with us. We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. That is ammunition and fuel for us to not live in fear, right? When we recall those things, when we think of those things, when we remember those things, do not fear. Do not be anxious about anything. And then he continues in verse 11. I will do for you all that you request or all that you ask. 
The New Living Translation kind of got my attention. It just said, I will do what is, and I like this, necessary. For some reason, that just kind of struck me. We don't know exactly how this is all going to work out, or maybe he didn't at the time. We're going to see some added information. But he's saying, I will do what is necessary. In one sense, he's expressing his desire to willingly fulfill her request, her appeal, her proposal to be her family kinsman redeemer. He's saying, I'm all in. I'm fully committed here. I will. And it strikes me here, there's no hesitation. There's no delay in this incredible response. I was really intrigued before we moved to verse 12 how he finishes verse 11. He didn't have to add this in there. But look at what he says about her character. For all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. I, I really love that. We've, we've come back to that over and over again. In one sense, he's saying, this is a very easy commitment for me to make. In one sense, because I and, and everyone, the leaders, the people, some translations you may have before you say, my fellow townsmen uh, in Bethlehem, they know. They know of your reputation as a woman of, and to build upon that, that word uh, virtuous, is you're a woman of courage, of strength, of valor of moral excellence, of purity in heart and action. One who is noble, characterized by valor and ability. One who is ethical, one who is righteous. Uh, some translations say moral excellence. A woman of excellence. As I thought about this, it, it really uh, seems that this is really a perfect marriage match that was made in heaven. You see, that word is the same word that was used in regards to Boaz in Ruth 2, 1, that his character is the same. But as with any good drama, and Mike Schaefer could tell us this as I've alluded to him so much, uh, throughout this study, uh, there has to be a caveat, doesn't there? There has to be a complication or a challenge, if you will, uh, something that's going to cause you to, to maybe sit on the end of your seat because you could think, oh, this has worked out great. I, I thought as I was thinking about this about Apollo 13 and on that mission and we all have heard the quote, you know, Houston, we have a problem. Actually, I listened to the transmission of that this week. And the actual quote is, Houston, we have had a problem. Because they knew something traumatic had occurred with that explosion. But here, we have in one sense, Boaz saying, Ruth, we have a problem. We have a challenge. We have a conflict. And he says, let me explain. Look at verse 12 as we continue on. Now, it is true that I am a close relative or a redeemer. However, there is a relative closer than I. You know, it's kind of one of those thoughts uh, when you're talking to somebody, I kind of, kind of hate the word but because usually it's like, oh, this and that but and then there's, <laughs> except the but God. <laughs> the rocks got on, that's a good follow-up. But a lot of times it's something negative or the, the however the however could be positive in the light of the information or the however could be negative. 
Uh, this, however, is, is one of the latter where uh, there's something going on here. And as I thought about this, possibly Boaz had already thought about the possibility of redemption here. Maybe he researched it a little bit. Maybe he thought about it. Um, maybe he was considering the opportunity of serving as the family kinsman redeemer in this circumstance. Maybe he thought about initiating it. Maybe he thought about how will I respond to it. And, but obviously uh, he was prepared in some way. In that light, he must have discovered and knew that there was a relative closer than he. I want us just to make a note here to me in this circumstance. Just look at the honesty. Look at the integrity, the openness and the transparency. He honestly spoke to her. He didn't infuse her with any false hope or waiting or anything. He just addressed it right head on. I, I just am amazed at, at this, this man. And even though he desires to redeem, which we are seeing in this whole text, he refuses to put his desire above God's, above God's revealed plan and God's process. There was something God had to say about this type of a circumstance, but he refuses to act upon his own thinking or feeling. He chooses to live in the light of the objective word of God. That's a man of integrity. That's a, a woman of integrity. He will not usurp God's plan and authority. How many times God just, people, I mean, just want to aid God in what he's doing. I love what you prayed this morning, Paula. We're just looking for where he's working and we're joining him in what he's doing. What a powerful thought for us. And I think that pictures Boaz. He's not really sure, but he's objectively going to live by faith. He acts righteously by deferring or preferring the rights of a closer relative or kinsman. He's willing to trust God and to submit to God in what he chooses in that circumstance. That's not always easy, is it? particularly when we do not understand and we want to lean to our own understanding and he's saying in your ear, just trust me. I've got this. You may not understand it. You may want to maybe grab what it is you want, but, but submit to me. Trust me. Follow me. And that's what I see here in uh, Boaz. He righteously defers to someone who is nearer in that relationship. Some think it, it may have been Boaz's brother who was older than he. He would have had, the text doesn't exactly tell us, but there was somebody that, that he knew that was closer than him. And I just think it's so powerful for him to defer. You know, one of the things I wanted to mention here before we continue, just as sort of a pastor's viewpoint, um, you know, a lot of people will talk, and to be sure, uh, challenges and trials and troubles, you know, they do help to strengthen us. But I think also what they do is they reveal our character. When you're put in a spot, you either choose to walk after the flesh or you choose to walk in the spirit. You choose to live by faith in what God has said or you choose to lean to your understanding, right? And it's really those tests and those trials that really help to show us where we are on this incredible progression of life and living. This reveals to me so much from that perspective. This reveals to me a man of, of incredible integrity and faithfulness. So Boaz, in that light, he instructs Ruth 
as we would move into verse 13. Stay this night. For her safety and her not traveling at home in the dark and the danger of, of midnight. We could say the midnight madness that may occur in Bethlehem, the danger that would be there for her. Stay or, or remain here, he says tonight. You see, in one sense, her mission is complete. She has done what she was sent to do through Naomi. And what Boaz chooses to do, and I love this, and I want to encourage us in this, he protects her. The Lord Jesus, our Kingsman Redeemer, is protecting us. In these incredible days that we live in, we can be assured of that. And he protects her physically from harm by not sending her out. But you guys, I want you to see this. He protects her sexually in that moment in time. A man of integrity. putting his own desires and things under and in submission to God and what God has said. And I think that's incredible and a vital lesson for all of us. And we see it lived out here. And in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you good, let him do it. He informs her, in other words, the first thing in the morning, I am going to inquire, I'm going to talk to this closer relative to see if he will or if he is able to exercise his responsibility or his duty to redeem. Boaz is a man of action. There's, there's no delay. He's going to seize the moment. It's there, and I just love that. That there's right then, right there, I'm not waiting. I know where he is. I know I can talk with him. I'm going to take care of this. And how that had to so just minister to her heart. And he says if he, the closer relative, is willing or he wants to redeem, good. Or very well, let him do it. Let him exercise his right. Let him redeem. Um, it's as though he's just saying, so be it. I, I'm yielded. I'm yielded to God. I'm yielded to what he wants. I think this really shows selfless sacrifice. I know in my heart from this text, he desires to redeem her. He desires that. But he's willing to set that aside because of God's revelation and the right of another individual, and he's willing to trust God in that process. And to me, it just shows what deep love that he has for God and for her. But then he continues and he says, but if he does not want to perform the duty for you, if he's unwilling or if he's unable, look at this, then I will perform the duty for you. I will do it. Be assured. I will redeem you myself. I will willingly receive and accept your request, your appeal, your proposal to fulfill the responsibility of a kinsman redeemer. In one sense, he's simply saying, Ruth, I will marry you. You will be safe. You will be secure. And I am willing to do that. For Ruth, to me, this is just a win-win in regards to her request. She is going to be redeemed, whether it be by another or whether it be by Boaz. And then he says, as the Lord lives. 
It can be translated as surely as the Lord lives. I just wanted to highlight this. This is a very solemn pledge. It's a promise to her before the true and living God of Israel. He didn't have to add that there, but he did. And that was so crucially important. It was assuring Ruth of the deep sincerity of this promise that he is making to her. And then he says, lie down until morning. He not only informs her, he then instructs her, and she faithfully responds. As I put myself in her place here, as she lies her head down, I thought, I wonder what was running through her mind. She's probably satisfied. Her mission's accomplished. I believe there had to be a sense of security. I'm going to be redeemed. Also, safety. She's going to be cared for that night, but also into the future. As she would have laid down, as maybe this is behind me, I thought with all those thoughts flowing in her mind, she might have just covered back up his feet. She may have just sort of curled up with just that, that sense of security and satisfaction and all the weight of thoughts off of her mind that all was going to be well. But maybe she had in her mind too, I wonder who that closer relative is. And I wonder if they will act as the kinsman redeemer. You know, I really have gotten to like Boaz, she might have thought. But I'm willing. I'm willing to flow through this process and see what God will do. So as we start to land this proclamation this morning. What we have revealed here from Ruth 3, 10 to 13 is God's sovereign providential plan. It's progressing. It's moving on. And I wanted to note this with Boaz. His integrity, his honor, and his purity. Just listen to a couple of these thoughts. Boaz blesses her. He accepts her. He greets her in a meaningful way. He commends her character. He encourages her. He assures her. He affirms her. He receives her. And he instructs her. I think that was a pretty powerful encounter that dear Ruth had, don't you? Man, how I would like to walk out of every encounter I had with somebody with all of that. And how about Ruth? Just one word, virtue. That's a powerful thought when we consider her. So this plane today is landed. We're starting to get off. But what we can we take with us? What are some of the relevant, uh, timeless applicabilities? You know, what difference does any of this make? It's always on my heart. What difference does it make that we were here to gather today? What difference does it make that and we really are looking at the Word of God? We know He said it's going to never uh, be void. It's going to accomplish what He purposes. So what can we kind of walk away with? I just wanted to give us a few uh, pastoral encouragements here that... Uh, Maybe we can carry into this week and, and with us as we move forward. First thing I want to make a note of this. Guys, family matters. Family matters. Whether it's natural family, and I would say here for our purposes, spiritual family. They are gifts to us. You see, family matters to God. It was God who chose to ordain and to institute the family, right? A man and a woman. Procreation, children, training, a man loving his wife as Christ loved the church. 
a woman respecting her husband, children honoring their parents. And in the church, we can just apply those same thoughts. Blessing, affirming, accepting, encouraging, informing, instructing. And brought up front something that I had given to all our kids several years ago. Our family will, and what's listed here is the one another commands. They apply to us in our own families. They apply to us in our family here. Bless one another. Greet one another. Commend one another. Receive one another. Accept one another. Instruct one another. Assure one another. Encourage one another. And supremely love. 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 Selfless and sacrificially one another. This is incredibly manifested here. A second thought that I wanted to make is to cultivate through Christ and his word virtue. Um, a lot of those words behind there, cultivate purity. And I want to say this, cultivate purity theologically. There is a lot of things that are not true that are put on the internet, the communication, the things... We have got to be wise as serpents, as gentle as doves, as we interpret the Word of God. But also, I want to say this morally. Cultivate purity. We live in a sensual time and season, do we not? You can't even watch a commercial hardly, can you? We need to flee youthful lusts. We need to flee sexual immorality whether in marriage or outside of marriage. But we need to be determined that through Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to live in accord with what He has revealed, not necessarily how we feel. So vitally important. One of the great challenges for men and women alike today is pornography. It is, it's incredible. We need to flee these things, you guys. And these guys model for us a purity of life. Also, I'll mention this real quick. We'll see it next week a little more is patience. Psalm 27 says, Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You see, that's a part of this cultivation of virtue. Just wait. God's got this. I heard a term yesterday I thought was pretty good. It was that we're all getting COVID fatigue. I've got COVID fatigue. I don't know if you guys do or not. But you know what somebody that watched us on Facebook texted me? They were texted me the importance of me saying, looking unto Jesus, running the race with what? Perseverance. You guys, we need to endure. But we do that by looking unto Jesus Christ. And we don't grow weary. We don't come discouraged, disheartened. Yes, I know it's hard, and I do. But what I'm saying is, is this a wide open opportunity for us to point people to and proclaim Jesus Christ? Galatians chapter 5 says the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and what? Long-suffering and patience. It's not you trying to work up patience. It's you allowing Christ through the Holy Spirit to manifest His patience. One other thought here is I love this. Dwayne, I was thinking of you, I think, when we ran that uh, half marathon in Baltimore, I think, it's when we got those green shirts, right? I think that was it. And on the side was, I will. And that was Under Armour's thing at that point. Um, I just want to say this. Fulfill your promises. When you say you're going to do something, do it. When you say you're not going to do something, don't do it. I love this. As surely as the Lord lives, I will. As he provides me strength and power, I will. And I just thought that was such a powerful thought 
and such an encouragement for us. And then this one, do not be afraid. Uh, Joshua, have I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Why? The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Wherever you go tomorrow, when you move, well, even right now, Jesus Christ is in you. Is he not able? Is he not capable? Did he not know? What? I'm just so convicted myself. You know, I've got no reason to fear. He's in me. He's with me. He's living. He's through me. He's going to address anything that I need to address. And it's such a powerful thought. And then in the light of Christ, I wanted to close with this thought. As new creations in Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, is our Redeemer. Boaz to Christ, our kinsman, Redeemer. If you have the New American Standard Version, verse 13 uses the word redeem four times. And I love, and you're going to absolutely love this, Dolores, because this is one of your favorite people, Tony Evans. And this is what Tony Evans said, and this is our exclamation point. Don't miss the word redeem. Through its use, Boaz is presented as an Old Testament type or picture, Rachel, we were talking about that this week, of Jesus Christ, who redeemed or bought back sinners from slavery to sin. Through Christ, our Redeemer, we are forgiven. We are set free from sin. We have a new relationship with God. Oh, beloved ones, today, be assured. Be assured in who Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, He is by grace through faith, your kinsman, Redeemer. Be assured who you are in Him. He bought you. He purchased you purchased you with his own blood and also be assured in what he does. We sang it. He loves you immeasurably. He protects you. And as a good kinsman redeemer, he provides for you right now and forevermore. Eternal and everlasting Father, we are so thankful today for the incredible revelation and the timeless application of the book of Ruth. How we pray that through the integrated life of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus, our kinsman redeemer, who is our life, would be manifested through us as we run the race that we're called to with perseverance looking unto him and that we would make manifest a sweet savor of his life and that he would receive all the glory. So we thank you for this day that you have made for us. We thank you for this incredible accounting, this historical account with so many theological ramifications and implications. And I pray, oh, how I pray today that the seed of the Word of God has fallen into my heart and into our hearts and that the soil is tilled up and fertile and may the word of God through Jesus Christ and by his spirit bear fruit 30, 60, 100 fold to the glory of God. And we pray all these things in the blessed name of our spiritual bridegroom, our kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory now and forevermore we pray. Amen. Well, in the light of our upcoming revival, our praise team is going to be doing some special sets for us. And we're going to introduce a new song. And that will be a part of those nights.
but we're going to uh, today uh, practice it. So why don't you stand with us and they're going to lead us and this just puts a huge exclamation point on everything we've talked to today and we continue to do. So you know what? Don't worry about what you don't know because you don't know what you don't know. But live in the light of what we do know. And we do know who Jesus Christ is. And we do know the certainty of his word and his promises. So you guys... Amen, huh? Thank you guys so much in the midst of all the challenges to take the time to learn something new and to lead us. In the words of Franny Crosby, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Can you say that today? Oh, what an incredible statement. This is my story. This is my song. 
So may we go forth today with the incredible thought that Jesus Christ is ours and he is mine. May God bless us. Have a great week. And I look forward to seeing you next week, everybody.